you're tuned in to the Believe in Arizona podcast. All right. Hello, Bear Down Believers. If you have anything to believe in after that, I'm your host, Matt Reynoldson, and that was just a putrid crash out performance from the Arizona Wildcats in Provo, Utah, a 41 to 19 loss at the hands of number 14 BYU in which the offense continued to get in his own, its own way. The coaching staff continued to get in the players way. And everything was just about as much of a mess as you could possibly, possibly imagine it out in Provo, Utah. Arizona falls to three and three on the season, just one and two in Big 12 conference play. And interestingly enough, that one win came against a top 10 Utah team on the road that just last night lost to the team that U of A fans are considering little brother up north. Well, ASU looks like they have a pretty strong football team, a pretty strong direction with Kenny Dillingham, and the Wildcats are seemingly searching for answers under Brent Brennan and this coaching staff. We'll break down everything that happened in this game. We'll complain about things. We'll yell about it. We'll you know, air our grievances, everything like that, over the next about half hour. And thank you for being with here with us on a day that I know you're frustrated. I'm frustrated after watching that one because that was not – good football in Provo, Utah. Not good football from the Arizona Wildcats. Do want to thank you, though, for joining us. Please make sure to like and subscribe to the show, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, tune in wherever you get your podcasts, as well as my YouTube page at Matt underscore Reynoldson. Don't worry. Basketball is only nine days away. We do have an exhibition for the Arizona Wildcats starting off. Basketball season starting off. Winter sports season looks to be a little bit better. And look, I mean, Let's call a spade a spade right now. This is the toughest team Arizona will have left on its remaining schedule. BYU is 6-0. Looks like they may be on the verge of a top-10 team going into next week's poll. And they looked every bit of it today, especially that defense in flummoxing the Arizona offense. All right, before we get into all our content on today's show, I want to remind you, today's show brought to you by these babies, Melon Hats. Really solid hat, really solid hat wear right there. You know, this is super versatile. You wear it to work, you know, you wear it to the gym, you know, go into the pool, everything like that. Keeps its form, keeps its shape, doesn't stink. You can sweat in it. You can go for a run in it even. And, you know, you you ever do like the, the hat sniff thing where you uh, smell the hat a little bit after and you're like, that probably needs to go in the laundry machine. Yeah, this one doesn't. You know, melon hats keep their shape, keep their freshness always. Perfect hats, important, essential part of your wardrobe. Go over to melin.com and get one for yourself. That's Melon Hats, built to be durable and comfortable and one of the sponsors of today's program. All right, BYU 41, Arizona 19. A crash out effort for the Arizona Wildcats. And before we get into the stats and figures of this game, I want to talk about just the massive, massive regression for this team. Arizona is now three and three on the year after winning its final seven games of the 2023 season. And Arizona has looked horrible in every single game, but one New Mexico was a team that came in to Tucson after losing to an FCS team in week one, after really blowing the game against an FCS team in week one and Arizona trailed for a lot of the first half of that game. Some of the first half, at least had to go back and forth with its defense and offense against a team that, you know, couldn't defend Jack. Honestly, uh, it took a heroic effort, a school record effort, 304 receiving yards from Tedaroa McMillan for the Wildcats to win that game and put up 61 points in that game. But the defense was a concern in game one. Then the opposite concern showed up in game two, and that one ended up tipping its hand to what the real issues were with this Arizona football team. That was the offense, you know, being held to six points in the first half against NAU, really struggling to the finish, a 22-10 win over Northern Arizona, who looks to be a pretty good FCS team. They're currently in a dogfight with FCS Power Montana on the road. Um, They are leading the Grizz for much of that game. Haven't checked the final score on that one yet, but NAU pretty solid outfit for the FCS level, but I think two concerns popped up in that game that really showed me that this could be a long season for the U of A. The first was the rash of injuries that happened after the New Mexico game. And cards on the table, I fully excused the rash of injuries after the New Mexico game, saying, okay, you know, it's just uh, it's just a precautionary measure. They're treating it like a preseason game. They're resting all these starters, everything like that, so as to not get people injured going into a big road game at Kansas State. No, those guys were actually injured. 
And I think that goes back to the strength and conditioning program. That goes back to the recovery program. A lot of things that weren't carried over effectively, not having any inside information on that. I need to look into it more. I'll update you when I do look into it more. But currently, it seems like there was not a lot of carryover from this program of strength and conditioning and recovery that Jed Fish established at the University of Arizona last year. And it's showing up. It's showing up big time because you, you look at this team right now, a rash of injuries again, you know, lost more defensive players today, you know, four or five defensive backs going down, you know, they're down to straw pickings on the back end. And, you know, you have a lot of guys pretty healthy on the defensive line, but that's because they rotate so much. So the guys that are playing a massive amount of snaps each and every game are not staying healthy. The offensive line was not healthy all throughout fall camp. There's been injuries here and there and everywhere. And you've seen guys kind of drop like flies left and right. And, you know, when you don't build the strength and conditioning and the depth of this team, that's going to take more of a toll than it will on other teams. So I think that showed up really heavily in game two. Uh, Arizona was not able to respond with a very good performance against Northern Arizona. And then week three, you know, it was a crash out performance, a 31 to seven loss to Kansas state that I explained away as, you know, that Kansas state's a good team. I still think K state's a good team. Granted, I really do think K state's a good team, but I explained that one away as, you know, the momentum got rolling in the wrong direction and things weren't going well and everything like that. And the team just didn't show enough resilience. The new coaching staff having been together for two games only at that point, two games under their belt to really be able to come back and, and make that a game at the very end. And K-State with Avery Johnson just kind of ran down Arizona's throat at the very end. OK, so he goes into bye week. Things kind of settle down a little bit. The temperature in the room is a little bit hot. And then, boom, everybody's happy again. Big win over Utah on the road. Arizona dominates it physically. They make the plays when they need to make it. Matt Adkins, new play caller. Everything looks a lot better on offense. The defense shows up, gets a couple huge fourth down stops inside their own 10-yard line on Utah's first two drives. Did the same thing again today. We'll get to that. But on Utah's first two drives, the defense shows up. Plays a great game all the way throughout, really stifling Isaac Wilson, the freshman quarterback from Utah, all the way throughout, and proving that, you know, this was a game that uh, Arizona was going to kind of plant their flag in and say, hey, we're here. We're here in the Big 12. And even though it's an old Pac 12 foe, you know, we got this. And so that was a really impressive performance against Utah. But then they come home, late game, national TV on Fox, 8 p.m. kickoff, Tucson time last week, and they lay an egg against Texas Tech. They laid an egg against Texas Tech. A good tech team, don't get me wrong, but this was a team that Arizona should have beaten at home, and they got shut out in the second quarter, 11-0. to Another ugly trend that showed up today, 14-0 shutout in the second quarter against BYU. And then the comeback in the second half, they get all the way back, they get up in the second half of this game, and then they crumble at crunch time. And their best players make mistakes and everybody starts making mistakes and the execution goes out the window and everything sort of falls apart right there. So another concerning performance right there against Texas Tech falls Arizona to three and two and people are concerned going into BYU. OK, but then the water settle a little bit. Maybe the team just needs to shut out the negativity and get out there on the road, face another top 15 team that's not super dynamic, but, you know, as a physical team, built a lot like that Utah team you beat on the road two weeks ago. You know, the betting markets really favoring Arizona. 90% of the public money was on BYU to cover the three-point spread in this game, but the Sharps were keeping this at a three-point spread, keeping the line from moving because all the Sharp money was on Arizona. And that looked pretty good early with Arizona starting off the game with a fourth down stop inside their own 10 yard line and then marching 95 yards, really a hundred yards with a false start penalty in the middle of that drive for the opening score on a great opening strip script by Matt Atkins. But what shows up that has shown up in this entire first half of the season for the Wildcats. We're now six games in six of the first 12 regular season games for this new staff. And what we have seen so far is a lack of organization, a lack of resilience, and a lack of ability to improve by the players and the position groups on this roster, particularly the offense. And before I get into the massive regression of this offense, including the atrocities from this offensive staff in ruining good players and really regressing good players, good offensive linemen, tanking guys like Jonas Avenia's draft stock, you know, things like that. 
do want to give credit to the defensive staff. A guy like Dwayne Aquino, who's been around a lot of football, he, he's had guys dropping like flies due to injury, and they're still playing hard. They're still getting fourth down stops. They're missing, you know, a couple captains today on the back end of their defense in trading Stukes and Gunnar Maldonado, and they still show up and played a pretty good game. The problem is the offense won't get out of their way. And when you commit four turnovers on the road, four turnovers on the road, and you average 3.6 yards per rush, 4.6 yards per play, Get this, Arizona almost outgained BYU in this game, but the offense was so situationally putrid between the 35 and the 20 of BYU, not even in the BYU red zone, between the 35 and the 20, that Arizona only put up 19 measly points. And they were out of the game the entire second half. One thing that stuck out to me was Jenny Taft on the Fox broadcast, the sideline reporter, wonderful sideline reporter for Fox, said, coming out of the locker room at halftime, Arizona head coach Brent Brennan told her the guys were coming out with fire and energy, super locked in, super focused, ready to make this a great game, great finish all the way through, down 14 to 7 and a half. Arizona getting the ball first. And what happens on that very first play? Shocker. Arizona doesn't pick up a blitz offensively. Noah Fafita makes another poor decision. Great play by the defensive end, batting the ball into the air, intercepting it inside the Arizona 10 yard line. Very next play. Cougars QB, Jake Retzloff, finds the end zone for a touchdown. It's 21-7, and it felt over at that point. And to Arizona, it looked over at that point. But they weren't done. Just a minute later, Fafita fumbles on another blitz that wasn't picked up, another backside rush that wasn't picked up. And Fafita fumbles, doesn't hold on to the ball, makes a poor decision, poor game from number 11. I'll call that what it is. But another blitz that wasn't picked up. Fafita fumbles. BYU capitalizes, and less than two minutes into the second half, this is a three-score game at 24-7. to A one-score game at half at 14-7, to and then less than two minutes later, when you started with the ball, a three-score game. Arizona fell apart, and it wasn't because of its defense. And at times, it was because of its quarterback. I'm not going to put all of this at the feet of Noah Fafita because... Look, Arizona would not be anywhere near as dynamic if number 11 wasn't the quarterback. I saw what I saw in camp. I know what the backup Cole Tannenbaum brings to the table. I know what the third stringer, Braden Dorman, brings to the table. You know, fourth stringer, Anthony Garcia, what have you. I know what these guys bring to the table, and Noah's a better quarterback. Noah makes poor decisions, but Noah is not coached to make better decisions. What I see in Every position group on offense, except for running backs. I need to give a shout out to Alonzo Carter, the running backs coach who came over from San Jose State. He's done a great job. Every single other position group on the offense has vastly regressed. The offensive line looks like a patchwork unit starting the wrong guys. Ryan Stewart played too long, starting too long on the offensive line, the injuries, but they didn't create any cohesion when the injuries were done. Currently, you got Rhino at left tackle. Wendell Moy at left guard, Josh Baker at center, Alexander Deuce at right guard, and Jonah Savanai at right tackle. And all of those guys look like they're playing their own game. The tight end blocking has been nowhere. I have not seen Sam Olson throw a chip block anywhere, and he seems to be targeted most of the tight end blocks, most of the tight end blocking plays. So you have that issue. You have the issue of not being able to throw the ball down the field because the wide receivers are poorly coached. Tedero McMillan looks like he's regressed. I'm just going to call a spade a spade. The guy will be a first-round draft pick, probably a top-10 pick because of his measurables and because he's just an incredible player, an incredible human. But he has regressed. He drops passes. He cannot create separation within this route tree because the route tree is so inconsistent and so confusing and not built to get T-Mac open. And so when you see as the first half wears along, as the second quarter wears along, BYU continuing to bracket number four and nobody else can get open and nobody else can do anything of note in the passing game. Shout out Montana Lamonius Craig with the opening touchdown, but really... You know, outside of a couple random plays here here and there from Ramella Murphy, Jeremiah Patterson, no real production in that passing game. And Fafita's getting blitzed every single time. And 
What did Kansas State show you? What did Texas Tech show you? What did NAU show you? That you can effectively blitz Arizona, and these offensive play callers, this offensive system, won't have an answer for it. Dino Babers was hired to be the offensive coordinator for Arizona. He's got a history at the U of A. He was part of the Dick Tomey era in Tucson. As was Brennan, as was Babers. Getting the band back together, right? Dino Babers was hired to be the offensive coordinator of this team and not coach quarterbacks. Instead, they were going to use one of the extra assistant coach positions, one of the new assistant coach positions with the NCAA knocking out the 10 assistant coach limit on the full-time assistant rule on a brand new quarterbacks coach in Lyle Moivau. I think Lyle Moivau will be a good coach one day. I don't think Lyle Moivau is ready to be a quarterbacks coach at the Power 5 level. So Dino Babers is coordinating the offense, but then after three games of putrid play calling, including the first game, I know they put up 61 points, but if you saw New Mexico's defense on the third play or fourth play or whatever it was with Arizona's offense, T-Mac getting wide open by 20 yards behind the defense, when your first-round draft pick goes for 304 yards, yeah, it's going to patch up a lot of holes in the offense. But the offensive play calling was poor in week one, putrid in week two, and downright pitiful in week three. So what do they do during the bye week? They make the transition to a tight ends coach that has never called plays before at the Division I level. Never called plays before at the Division I level. And they make the transition, and he goes and calls a really good game at Utah. And then with Texas Tech and now BYU having film on what Adkins does as an offensive play caller, they're able to exploit him after the opening script is done. Arizona can score on the script. Adkins is a good play caller on the script. We saw that today. They drove 100 yards on their first offensive possession. The guy has the bones of being a good play caller. He's not there yet, and the other teams are scouting what he turns into tendency-wise after the script is done. So you turn to an offensive coordinator that doesn't touch quarterbacks and doesn't call plays, and then you turn over the play calling to, instead of the head coach, who is an accomplished play caller in his own right. Now we're going to bring up one of the other young guys. And reading between the lines of the press conferences, they didn't have a plan for it to be Matt Adkins. They weren't always mapping out for it to be Matt Adkins. They said, one of our young coaches who we thought was going to grow into a good play caller was going to do this. Does that mean it could have been Josh Oglesby, the offensive line coach? Does that mean it could have been Bobby Wade, the wide receivers coach? Who knows? I mean, it could have been Lyle, Lyle Moivau, the quarterback's coach. Who knows? They didn't have a plan. So they brought in Dino Babers after he got fired at Syracuse. And I don't know. Did he want to be here? Did he want to be here? Feels like Brennan kind of begged him to be here. And they said, okay, Dino Babers, we're going to have you come in and coach up these young offensive coordinators. Except... I mean, was Babers really an A-plus hire? I mean, this isn't Andy Reid coming in and coaching up young play callers after his retirement. You know, this is this is Dino Babers. Let's talk about exactly what he is. He hasn't ever been like this offensive mastermind, prolific play caller at the college football level. Had a couple good seasons at Syracuse. Had a couple good seasons at a coordinator elsewhere. But see this offensive genius here in 2024? to coach up these young guys. So they came in without a plan of who was going to succeed Babers as play caller. They came in without a real plan of what to do at quarterbacks coach. They threw together an offensive staff of Alonzo Carter, running backs coach, a plus higher than one of the big pullovers from San Jose state. They brought in Josh Oglesby, the offensive line coach from San Jose State, who clearly has had a lot of trouble getting this unit to have cohesion, especially after so many of them have been in and out of the lineup with injuries. So the offensive line has done a poor job. The tight ends, especially you know, with Adkins taking over play calling, they've done a little poorer job. You know, Kean Burnett is a great athlete and a great player, but Tyler Powell, nowhere to be seen. Roberto Miranda, nowhere to be seen. Sam Olson, kind of a liability on the field sometimes. So Burnett's making splashes in the passing game, but since that Utah game, he's been you know kind of quiet here and there. 
Today, Burnett, three catches, 34 yards on six targets. He, he's been kind of quiet. So the tight ends have regressed, obviously, from Tanner McLaughlin last year. And then the wide receivers. I know Bobby Wade is a program legend. I know he's coached wide receivers up north at ASU. I know he has been a good receiver in and of himself. Does he know how to coach receivers in this offense? And the better question, the more overarching question that is not an indictment on Bobby Wade is, do the wide receivers know what they're doing in this offense? Does anybody know what they're doing in this offense? And that includes, and that starts with number 11. Is the game plan, is the identity, what is preached to this offense? Because last year, they knew exactly what they were at all times. They were going to throw teams off balance with the run, and they were going to get quick hitters in the passing game, and then burn you on deep balls when you got sucked up. Every Jed Fish offensive series from last year, once Jaden once Jaden Delora went down with an ankle injury, every Jed Fish offensive series felt like it had a plan. I was there on the field. I was seeing it from you to me, right in front of me. Everything on offense for Arizona for most of the second half of that season, bar, bar maybe the first half of that bowl game, but the second half really proved that out, looked like it had a plan in Jed Fish's offense. What is the plan for this offense? What is the identity for this offense? Because I tell you what it's not, or maybe it is, but it shouldn't be, 4.6 yards per play. 3.6 yards per rush, four turnovers, and getting your quarterback hit time after time after time and putting Fafita's body on the line. He is taking a beating back there, and it looks like it's taking a toll on him. Number 11 is cool, calm, and collected, and a guy that shows incredible mental resolve. But do you really expect him to throw darts every single time while he's getting knocked to the turf by 300-pound monster defensive linemen? And this isn't about the amount of time that he has in the pocket because he does have you know a good amount of time sometimes. But if you don't preach the actual passing game concepts to your quarterback and he doesn't know where to, he doesn't know where to look, he's not going to have a good game. And we've seen that several times with the rash of interceptions that Fafita's had. Fafita now has eight touchdowns and nine interceptions on the season. A significant regression as far as both completion percentage, turnover rate, not so much yards per game, but significant efficiency depletion. What's going on with Noah Fafita? Well, I'll tell you what's going on. It's how he's coached. Noah Fafita looks poorly coached out there, both from an offensive coordination, from an offensive identity, looks like he's not on the same page with his receivers, and screw it, T-Mac down there, it's only going to work so many times. This conference is too good to just have one great player and just hope everything else goes well. And that's what U of A is trying with T-Mac, and they're putting so much on number four's shoulders that number four is starting to make mistakes. We saw a big drop today. We saw a big drop last week against Texas Tech and that big fumble late in the game against Texas Tech as well. Tedero McMillan has too much on his shoulders, and his mistakes are starting to become glaring. But that's a small microcosm of the overall issue, which is that Arizona is not a good enough team to overcome small mistakes. College football is all about overcoming small mistakes. It's about having identity, resolve, and bread and butter to be able to say, okay, things aren't going well, or we got a penalty, or that drive didn't go our way. We're going to lean on this because this is what we are as a team. This is what we are as a program. And other reporters... Time and time and time again, week after week after week. I want to give credit to my comrades in the Arizona media. Time after time, other reporters have asked Brent Brennan what the identity of this team is. And I have had I have not heard one single convincing answer. So what's the identity of Arizona football? What is it? I'll tell you what the identity is of it halfway through the season. It's a team that gets physically overmatched. It's a defense that is opportunistic, but gives up too many yards. It's an offense that turns the ball over too much, is situationally poor, 
and cannot run up the gut. It's a wide receiver group that looks like they're all staring at number four, waiting to see what he does before making a decision of what to do. And it's a coaching staff from the top down, from the top down, and I'm saying the top being Brent Brennan. It's a coaching staff that looks like it does not have a clear succession of communication. Brennan's doing his own thing. Dwayne Akeen is doing his own thing. Dino Babers is certainly doing his own thing. Now Matt Atkins is doing his own thing. Special teams have been pretty good, but have failed at the wrong points of the season. They were pretty solid today, and that helps when you have an All-American kicker. So, But Danny Gonzalez is doing his own thing, too, the special teams coordinator. So this hodgepodge of coaches that was thrown together in late January, where's the cohesion? When's it going to work? How is it going to work? I don't know at this point. Because right now, my evidentiary, the evidentiary evidence, what my eyes tell me, is that this is a 3-3 three and three football team and maybe lucky to be that. 41-19. to 19. It was every bit that bad. And I was a little worried, you know, toward the end of this thing because the result was well in hand uh, during the first two minutes of the second half. We all know that, right? The result was well in hand. And I was a little worried after Arizona got the touchdown to cut it to 34-19 and then recovered a fumble that, okay, like... This game's over, but they're going to go down and they're going to score again. They're going to maybe make this a 12-point game or maybe make it an 8-point game. And then BYU is just going to hammer the ball and run out the clock. And it's going to look like an 8-point loss. And everybody's going to say, oh, okay, well, it wasn't that bad. An 8-point loss on the road to a top 15 team, a physical team, at home, big noon kickoff, great environment. It's not that bad. I was a little worried that was going to happen. But this, a result like this, that forces Arizona to look itself in the face and look itself in the face as a three and three football team that just got their doors blown off on the road. Their doors blown off. And they're putting a good quarterback in position to make bad decisions. That doesn't completely absolve number 11, does not completely absolve Fafita of those decisions. But they're putting him in position to make bad decisions. They're giving him no answers. This offensive coaching staff was thrown together at the end of January, Babers being the last one to come in. And Babers is leading this group with what identity? Or is Brennan leading this group? Or is Adkins leading this group? Or is everybody on the offensive staff kind of doing their own thing outside of the identity of this team? I don't know. I'm going to go ask the questions next week. That's why I'm going to be there for homecoming. I want to ask the questions. And right now, it looks like Arizona will be a significant underdog to Colorado at home. And let's hope for homecoming for the U of A, which is a wonderful tradition, that that stadium is not painted black and gold. Those disgusting black and gold Colorado colors. I don't want to see you invasion in Tucson. But I mean, I don't blame Wildcat fans right now because there's not a lot to be proud of when you look at a performance like this. 7-0 7-0 after the first quarter. 41-12 the rest of the way. Injuries. Guys dropping like flies. Guys looking out of shape. Guys looking beat off the ball at the line of scrimmage. The coordination not having any idea how to pick up a blitz or to scheme against the blitz. Except for the, the only answer they had to break the blitz was forcing your five foot nine quarterback to throw rainball rainball throw rainbow balls over the outstretched arms of six foot four, six foot five grown men defensive linemen, many of whom have children and are married. There are 62 children of players on this BYU roster. And that group, that group looked like a bunch of grown men out there against Arizona today, against a team that looked like they were a bunch of kids running around. Let's roll through some of these stats. The yardage advantage is completely deceiving. BYU 398 to Arizona 389. And that was just because of the total plays. I mean, BYU 6.6 yards per play. Arizona 4.6 yards per play. Um, You know, BYU massively winning the penalty battle. Only three penalties for 39 yards. Arizona 8 for 51. Um, You know, Arizona won the 
first down battle. They were 11, 19 on third downs. It's pretty good. Just one of four on fourth downs. So that's not, not, that's not very good, but Arizona ran 84 total plays to BYU's 60 total plays and BYU outgained Arizona 6.6 yards per play. An efficient day for Jake Retzloff, 18 to 32, 218, two touchdowns. BYU also scored on a trick play touchdown that Marquise Groves Killebrew had no excuse not to intercept. It was a rainbow ball floated. Groves Killebrew took a horrible angle on that. That made it 14-7 BYU at the end of the first half. It's, I mean, you watch the third quarter. Felt It looked like Arizona just thought, okay, it's a foregone conclusion that we're going to swing the pendulum back in our favor like we did against Texas Tech. The Wildcats thought, okay, this is our quarter. And BYU said, no, this is ours. This is our home field. This is our showcase. This is our opportunity to show and prove that we're a top 15 team. And BYU went out there and did that with good run defense, holding Arizona to 3.6 yards per carry. And that's on a pretty good day. Decent rushing performance from guys like Kedrick Riesano and Quali Conley. Some nice wrinkles with Noah Fafita in the run game. But the offensive efficiency, the offensive execution, the crucial downs, the crucial situations, Arizona's play calling disappeared, its plan disappeared, its execution disappeared, and it continually put the defense in a horrible spot. Continually put the defense in a horrible spot. So BYU putting up 41 points on the U of A and essentially... 17 of those coming off Fafita because there was a, a pick six to end the game. Um, yeah, there's a pick six to end the game. Let's uh, let's let's roll through just kind of this final final sequence here. Yeah, pick six, 21 yard pick six uh, to end the game with 113 left. Um, Noah also threw a pick that uh, was intercepted inside Arizona's own 10 yard line that was later turned into a touchdown one play later. Uh, Noah fumbled, which was turned into uh, three points. And then uh, the interception in the end zone when it was 7-7, or I guess interception on the one-yard line, poor throw into double coverage when he had the tight end available at the sticks. So four Fafita turnovers. Yep, four Fafita turnovers. Four turnovers for the game for Arizona, all on the back of Noah Fafita. Number 11 did not play well. Uh, you know, I feel for a guy like that who has been such a good leader, been such a strong, you know, emotional carrier of this team. But I don't know. I mean, I, it's all kind of flooding back to me, some of the cracks in the foundation in this offseason. When you hear a new staff come in and just say, okay, the players have the identity. We don't need to change anything. Now, they didn't need to change anything but they needed to reinforce exactly what it was about the player leadership outside of just family. Every football team's a family. Every football team goes through stuff. And the only ones that aren't are the ones that are just really talented teams at the very high level. But every football team has family elements to it. Look, you're going to a war with 110 guys on a daily basis in spring ball and summer conditioning, winter conditioning, fall practices, everything like that. You're going to war with 110 guys. Every team has elements of family. That can't be the only identity to this program. What the new staff needed to do was come in and identify exactly what it was about the Servite guys, about the Juice County guys, about the leaders in the back end, about the leaders on this team that truly reinforced the identity of this program. Outside of just, we're doing this together. Tell me what it was that made this team tough last year. And I'm not paid enough to do that. I don't know. I can't diagnose exactly what it was that made this a tough team last year. But what I do know is that this team had a different identity last year. And it may have still been player-led, but that needed to be reinforced by this staff. And it wasn't. It wasn't. This team looks disorganized. This team looks dysfunctional. And now this team is 3-3. Three and three. That's disappointing. Is that disappointing to you? Because it's disappointing to me. I mean, I... I don't want to be looking forward to basketball season now, but we are. You know, we're, we're going to end up nine days from now, 15 days from now, whenever the second exhibition is, putting too much stock into exhibition games in an Arizona basketball team that's going to be pretty darn good. And I'll talk a lot more basketball next week because that's the point we've reached in the football season. And that's the point 
it feels like for the longtime Arizona football fans that you reach in October just about every single year. That, okay, time to turn the page to McHale. And there are some real diehard Arizona football fans. There are some people that have been with this program, that have been with this team, that have poured their heart and soul into the Wildcats, into the bear down mentality of Arizona football that know this program is more than just filler time before basketball. I feel for those fans today. I feel for the fans that knew Arizona went up to Provo with a good shot to knock off a very good BYU team and watched this team crumble. Again, this is a watershed moment. This is a crash out moment. And we'll find out with this staff, with this team, with this roster, with this program, and the future of this program, what it does from here. Because you got a real cocky Colorado team coming in here next week. Then you got a pretty darn good West Virginia team the following week. Then you have a November with a couple road games at teams like UCF and TCU. And then at the end of the season, all of a sudden, your home game, your Territorial Cup, the game that you've owned for the last couple of years, uh, that game looks to be very, very tough now with ASU surging under second-year head coach Kenny Dillingham. So it's not going to be an easy road for Arizona to bowl eligibility. But it starts next week, and really, it starts tomorrow. It starts when the plane lands on the tarmac in Tucson, and this team and this coaching staff and this program decides, what are we going to be in the rest of 2024? This isn't about the playoff anymore. This isn't about surging your way back in contention in the Big 12. This is about showing some pride. This is about showing ownership of the A and showing that this team really wants to fight for each other. And this coaching staff really wants to fight for these players. And we'll find out starting next week against Colorado. We'll find out. And if it crashes out, if it continues to crash out, Arizona will continue to fight for a bowl game. They may be in the Las Vegas Bowl or something like that at the end of the year, or they may miss a bowl game altogether. I don't know. It's kind of the riding wave of the season. And we'll flood our focus from basketball to football, back to basketball, back to football, maybe sprinkle in a little baseball there and you know, look ahead to what Arizona can do from a recruiting standpoint and maybe some staff changes at, at that point as well. But this is the moment where you decide, if you're within this Arizona football program, what you want 2024 to be. Because Arizona was 3-3 three and three last year, too. And how did we feel about Arizona in December? One whole heck of a lot different. So how will we feel about 2024, Arizona? You're hoping it's different than you feel now on Saturday, October 12th. All right, your final score, 41-19. BYU over Arizona. The Wildcats fall to 3-3 three and three on the season. They'll come back home for homecoming next Saturday, 1 p.m. kickoff against Colorado at Arizona Stadium. That's a you know prime showcase on Fox. Really looking forward to that one and looking forward to being back in Tucson for homecoming weekend. Share your frustrations with me. I feel it. I'm here. I wanted this to be an errance of grievances of such. So throw those comments down in my YouTube page at Matt underscore Reynoldson. Throw those down there because I want to talk about it. I want to talk about what we just saw. I want to talk about the cracks in the foundation in this program and how it can be fixed. I'm an optimistic guy. I think they can be fixed, but I've seen no empirical evidence right now to say they'll be fixed quickly. So give me your solutions, air your grievances. I want to hear them all in the comments on my YouTube page at Matt underscore Reynoldson. Please listen to the audio of this podcast as well. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks so much, for, as always, for listening to the Believe in Arizona podcast. We'll be back early on next week for a look at basketball and a look ahead to Colorado. But for now, bear down and have a great rest of your weekend.